Okay, we are ready to rock and roll. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you for our special guests, Terry Combs, Jeff Morgenthaler, and Matthew Rome. Matt, thanks for jumping in. You are our special guest today. Uh, this is episode three of Fact or Fiction. Fact or Fiction. This has been a popular webinar series for us at Equipment Zone, so um, that's really cool because this is really about the users and those that are tuned in and the questions that they have. So we came prepared with a few questions, uh, but the, uh, the reality is too that uh, this, this, if it works well, we will have uh, extra questions from those that have tuned in. And if we can, I will actually even go so far as to try and let them ask live. So we'll see how that works. That doesn't always work, but we're gonna give it a shot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and have some fun with it. Most importantly, we want to answer great questions. And so let's not waste any more time. Let's jump right into that. Um, I'm going to kick this off and uh, let's, let's, let's try to go in this order. And we'll probably lose this order. But if we can start with Terry, then go with Jeff, then go with Matt, um, we'll see how we can do. And then as other questions come in, we'll pay attention to those. And uh, again, for those of you who have not done this before, if anybody's tuned in for the first time, you should be able to access the question and answer section where it says Q&A, or you can uh, jump in and say something in the chat. We really love the Q&A side because we can record those and download those. And if we can't get to it live, um, then Terry and Jeff do a really good job of reaching out after the fact via email. So if, if you really want to make sure for us to answer your questions, either live or afterwards, use the Q&A. So far, so good. How are those for the instructions? Great. Perfect. Let's do Great. it. Let's do it. Question number one, fact or fiction. What are the actual costs of operation? And I'm assuming that means the printer and not the entire business. Terry, <laughs> what do you think? If we're going to talk about costs and operational costs, the F2100, sure. maybe you could start. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, we, we start from, from the idea of a 10 by 12 image. Now, the printer's going to print 16 by 20 if you want to, but the average t-shirt print fits within 10 by 12. And if you don't believe me, go to your t-shirt drawer and start measuring images and you'll see they most all of them fit unless uh, you're a big follower of NASCAR and uh, then your images are bigger. <laughs> but uh, so based on that, if I'm printing a white shirt, I'm looking at about 50 cents in cost, ink cost. If I'm printing a, a color shirt with a white underbase, then I'm looking at about $2 in cost. I've got about 25 cents in pre-treat. Uh, your other expenses, when if, if you have a, an Epson F2000 or an Epson F2100, the 2100 does this automatically, but your cost for cleaning solution that uh, with an F2000 you manually put in at the end of the night before you turn the printer off, with the F2100, when you turn the printer off at night, it goes through the cycle. It'll put cleaning solution through the print head, down through the capping station and flush out the, um, the excess ink. You don't lose any ink in that process, by the way. That's $8 a month. Then um, the, this Epson printer has a cloth wiper rather than, a, um, rather than a, a wiper blade like you'll see in a lot of other printers. And that cloth wiper, uh, after 1,500 prints, and a, and a a color shirt, that's two prints, the white print and then the color print. After 1,500 prints, you're going to replace that. The printer's going to warn you beforehand, and you're looking at $108.95 for that. Once you divide it by 1,500, though, it's pretty inexpensive. Keeps that print head perfectly clean, and those are basically your cost of operation. I don't know if I left anything for the other guys to say. <laughs> that was a great answer. I was just going to say, Jeff, maybe you could get gifts uh, a range, Jeff, if, there's, if there is a range. Like if you were given a monthly range, what would that look like? In operating cost? Yeah, um, yeah I'd say you're, you're right around, what, 20 bucks? If you're factoring in the cost of the, the printhead cleaning kit and the cleaning fluid, it, this is the most inexpensive printer on the market to maintain. I, I haven't seen anything close to it. You know, uh, and let me throw one more thing in here, if you don't mind, Jeff. Uh, the, you know, a lot of uh, websites for competitive machines, they'll talk about the Epson requires you to do white ink flushing and things like that. It just isn't true. That, that is not necessary with this printer. And uh, does uh, cost very little to do head cleaning, that sort of thing. I mean, $2 or, or less. Some head cleaning can be as, as little as 38 cents. So 
um, you know, when you're reading those types of things and, and somebody on, with XYZ machine says, well, you know, that Epson, it takes $120 worth of ink every month. It's, that's just not true. <laughs> That's it's fiction, Terry. It's That's what fiction. we call fiction. I don't want to say they're lying, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to say, but some would. Some would say that. Some would. Uh, that's interesting. We're not, we're not sure who those folks are, so we can't call them out specifically. Uh, Matt, is there anything to add on that? I know this is a, a sensitive question for you, but I think- Well, no. One of the things that I think a lot of people ask me, number one question, how much does it cost to print a shirt? Okay. Okay. Here's a good way to go about and, and find out how much does it cost to print a shirt. You can go to Epson.com F2100 downloads and download Garment Creator. That's our software that, that imports the files and it actually runs the printer. So within that software, you can bring your own file in and there's a cost calculator and it will actually tell you your cost in ink for printing that garment. So I think that's a really good tool and anybody can go and download it and it runs on a PC or a Mac. Try it out. That's a great addition. So, so I would really give a user uh, a, a fair vision of both the actual cost of operation and the cost per print. So I'm really glad that you added that. Thank you, Matt. We're glad you're here. I don't know why these guys had any issues earlier. I mean, this is like... <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Matt, we're teasing you. We're, we're thrilled that you're here. And, and, and Tom Brady says hi. So what are the steps, Terry, to maintaining the Epson F2100, the current shipping version of the Epson DTG printer? Okay, well, uh, first thing you're going to do when you turn the printer on in the morning, it's going to tell you to shake the white ink. Uh, now you have to do that with all DTG printers that, but the, the Epson will, will t uh, tell you to do it. Uh, you could lie to it and say you did it and you didn't, but you don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, and, uh, and beyond that, at the end of the day, now Epson says do this every week. Our techs say do it every day, but you're going to take a swab and you're going to wipe around the capping station. And that just uh, makes it so the print head seals tightly against the capping station so that there's no leaking of, of air into that area uh, that, that could cause it to clog. But other than that, the machine maintains itself. So that was an easy answer for you is what you're saying. There was. Jeff, anything to add in terms of maintenance? We, we get this question a lot. I, I don't know if it's the, the misinformation. I don't know if it's the expectation that this is a difficult machine. But I think people in general just have an expectation from past experiences or things they've read online about other printers or things they've heard from competitors that machines are uh, very difficult to maintain. And that's one thing Epson has worked very hard about on this printer is to make it very easy to maintain. So like Terry explained very well, it maintains itself. And there's minimal stuff that you have to do. There's, there's a waste tank in the back that occasionally you'll have to empty, but the screen on the front of the printer will tell you when it's getting full. Um, and then you have to swap out the parts for the print head cleaning kit. But other than that, this printer is phenomenal. In fact, sometimes when I'm talking to people, I feel like there needs to be more. <laughs> it's such an easy answer. And what you have to do, I, I don't want them to think I, I'm not sharing everything with them, but that is it. You're, you're just checking that capping station and, and replacing those print head cleaning parts. Hey, Jeff, uh, tell uh, the listeners uh, uh, Wade's secret for disposing of the, of the waste tank ink. About putting the kitty litter in it? Yeah. <laughs> so there's a kitty litter, and, and I've heard this before, too. It's, it's a great tip to put kitty litter in your waste tank, and so the, the fluid that goes in there will solidify, and then you can just throw it in the trash. Oh, that's a great tip. How come you guys kept that secret? Oh, we saved it for this webinar, Jay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that is really good because Matt was here. That's why you're trying to impress there Matt Rome. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can yeah. you can take also take like a coffee can or something, put kitty litter in, and just pour the waste in there. And that way, you don't have to, uh, you know, try to get it out of your waste tank. No, that's a good tip for maintenance. So, Matt, anything to add? Anything to clarify? Well, here's the thing: a lot of people don't like to talk about maintenance because on a lot of machines, it is pretty intense. You have to go through a lot of procedures. You waste a lot of ink. At Epson, we try to be 
I hate this word, but we try to be very transparent with a customer before they purchase the machine. So if you go to Epson.com F2100 and download, we actually publish and you can find the complete maintenance procedure on the printer. So before you even purchase it, you can download and get that. I challenge you to find that on anyone else's website. Mm, that's a great tip. I think that's important information. I also want to emphasize that if someone were to feel stuck or confused or maybe they misunderstood something, they could always get some clarity from our team so they could reach out to our tech support team. You know, we've got full-time techs that, that this is what they do. This is what they know. So they're totally prepared in every way to explain the process, to walk people through it. And even right now, you can't really hear them and you certainly can't see them, but Roy's in there right now doing a, a training and a, and a virtual training with a webcam and he's walking someone through all of the setup, all of the process and all of the maintenance parts right now. So I, I'm uh, obviously a little biased, but uh, proud of our team. Uh, Jay, since you brought up his training, I, I just like, we have a, don't have this question on our list, but this has been coming up a lot. Yeah, let's take, let's go for it. Since we are in the middle of this pandemic and, and in, uh, you know, self quarantine or, lockdown, whatever you want to call it, people have been asking me, how are we handling the training? Because before this started, we were sending texts out to everybody who purchased a printer and they would go there live in person at their shop and train mm -hmm. them for a day. And that was a, a big part of our success. And so people have asked, how are you handling it now? So just like you said, you know, Roy's in there. And, and what I love about the way Roy is handling it is he takes his time with, with clients. He answers all of their questions and sometimes that takes all day. He's on that, on that live one-on-one -on -one video conference going through the printer. He can take the camera up to the printer. That's right. And show up close things that he's doing so that they can follow along. And I think it's been very successful. I haven't heard one person complain about it. Let me tell you, I've, I've had quite the, uh, the honor and opportunity to see and hear the feedback of, of people and how grateful they are. And, and I, don't, I couldn't tell you what other you know, dealers are doing, but here's what I know we're doing. Roy spends between four, he blocks off four to five hours, but I've seen him here at the sixth hour and at the seventh hour, just still maintaining and still answering questions. And as people keep thinking through something or they'll actually practice printing live together, um, he's still on. He just stays on there and lets them ask questions as they're working through the process. So, uh, and, you know, Jay, Roy's and let me add, and I know Jeff mentioned this, but this is one on one. Uh, th th this isn't a group training where there are five different companies oh, right. getting trained. It's this is uh, it's one dedicated. person to uh, to one company. Exactly. Hundred percent. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay, we have we have a question that came in. So before we go through some of the others, let, let's deviate just a little bit. Um, someone has asked about brightness of colors. How do we get the colors at their maximum brightness? What what would be something that you could answer or ideas that you might share with our audience and participants that have tuned in today about getting bright prints out of the F twenty one hundred? Jeff, do you want to start this time? Sure. Um, we, we actually did a live uh, demo webinar where I walked through the entire printing process and we just picked a, a graphic with no extra special preparation. It was one of Dane's graphics from greatdanegraphics.com and we printed it out on level three on the printer, which is quality level three and it looked amazing for those. If any of you were in that, it looked awesome and i think the print cost on it was 85 cents yeah we were all a little surprised that it was under a dollar yeah. in a good way happy surprised thrilled it looked great so one thing that uh, we've talked about a lot in these webinars is increasing that quality level will actually put down more ink and that doesn't always make your print look better sometimes when you put down too much uh, white ink it stays wet and when the cmyk goes on top of it it, it blends in a little bit and when you heat press it, it, that actually causes it to dull. So having the proper settings for your graphic are the most important part of making that look good. Proper pre-treating, um, having the right shirt. We talk about the secret sauce or the formula and we've gone into depth on this and, and we could spend another entire webinar going through all of those different things. But 
the proper shirt, proper pre-treating, having the correct settings in garment creator for your graphic all add up to a great looking print. Excellent, well said. And you know, uh, the, the, the last step in the process, we'll, we'll have somebody say, gosh, uh, you know, my shirt looks awesome right up until I, I heat press it and then it's all muted, it's all dull. Well, that's because you've uh, used too much pressure. You want uh, on your heat press just enough uh, pressure just to touch the shirt. Heat presses are contact heat sources. So, you know, a lot of people like to hover. All hovering is doing is allowing that shirt to air dry for an extra minute or two because that heat press is not generating heat until it touches. But but back off on your pressure. pressure. That one trick you can do is put a shirt on your heat press, put your silicone coated parchment paper on there, uh, bring down the heat press uh, to the point and, and uh, back off your pressure until you can just pull that silicone sheet out and then give it about a quarter turn more pressure so that it will hold that paper in there, but just touching the shirt and that'll be all the difference in the world. And we hear that all the time. Uh, people saying my shirts look dull. If you've come by our booth at any trade show, you've seen the shirts and, and you know, we backed all the way off on that pressure and their shirts real, the, the images jump off the shirts. Great guys. We've got a couple of questions that came in. I want to, I want to throw these at you, Matt, if that's okay, I'm going to, uh, uh, save, save, save some of your answers for a few questions. And feel free to jump in at any time. Uh, Christina Smith has asked, when we pre-treat a hot pink shirt, should we be using a light pre-treat or the dark pre-treat? And I'm thinking they're talking about the solution for pre-treatment. Well, if, if, if it has white ink, then you're going to need to use the, the dark pre-treat. But you can, you can uh, actually make that solution uh, a little more water, a little less pre-treat. If, if that's your concern and, and your, to, to lay down less pre-treat. And also if you're using uh, uh, like our speed treater TX, you can speed it up a little bit to lay down less pre-treat. But, but the, the light pre-treat uh, is actually for CMYK ink, not for white ink. Well said, well said. Um, Kevin Elvin has also asked another question. He's asked two. Kevin, I'm gonna ask that Jeff or Terry reach out to you via email regarding the totals and the difference between printing and maintenance so they can have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with you offline. But your other question I wanna answer, and let the guys try to take a shot at this. Kevin asked, I've had problems or challenges with the white ink cartridges having a lot of ink, but the chip is telling the printer that it's almost out. How can he either reset or recover? What should he do to get a true reading? There you go, I'll take that question. All right. So, here we go. There's always going to be a little bit of ink left in the cartridge. We actually overfill the cartridges. So there's, you get actually more ink than what you pay for. I know that was a big thing here a couple of years ago and Equipment Zone actually took five cartridges and cut them open and measured the amount of ink that was in them. And they actually came out that there was more uh, ink than what you paid for. Now, if you ever do have a cartridge, let's say that halfway through using the cartridge, there's half as much ink left in it, please call Epson Technical Support. If there is an issue that a cartridge, I mean, come on, things happen, right? Could happen. Yeah, it could happen. You know, I'm not saying it it's won't. It's going to be it rare. Could happen. That's right. It is rare, but it could happen that you could use a little bit of ink and then the cartridge dies please call Epson Technical Support and we will take care of that issue for you. That Excellent. number, by the way, is 562-276-1305. Uh, so Epson Tech Support is 562-276-1305. Or you can also call our office and we can get that number for you as well. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Great question. Great answer. Um, let's take another one from Andre. I think it's Andre or Andre, Andre DeWald. When should we use cleaning fluid for extended storage if we move the printer? So tell us a little bit what you know, Terry, Jeff, Matt, when should we be using cleaning fluid? Question mark. I, I, I'm assuming he's saying um, to flush the printer because the printer always has cleaning fluid in it for the tube washing 
So I guess that question. So let's take it from if I'm going to have to go into an extended storage where I'm going to turn off my printer for very, you know, for four months, or if I'm going to move the printer, let's, those are two different scenarios. Maybe we could address those. Yeah. So you don't have to flush out your ink and put in cleaning fluid to move it. You're just going to secure that print head and follow the instructions and we're, we're moving it. And by is the, that, is that true for the 2000 and the 2100? That's correct. Okay. Uh, but for four months, um, if it were going to be four months that you weren't going to run it at all, you're putting it in storage, then yeah, I would flush out the ink and put in cleaning solution. There's a there's a, a an option in the menu for basically putting that that printer to sleep, and we've we've actually shared that information a few times with folks uh, who have had to close their businesses because of the of the uh, coronavirus, and and so they've contacted us about how to follow those steps to, to put that, that printer in storage. You know, I have a customer uh, who, uh, whose business is only open five months out of the year. So he puts his printer to sleep for seven months um, every single year. That makes too much sense to me. <laughs> okay, so um, Kevin has followed up with, uh, but the cartridge is three fourths full and showing empty. Kevin, it sounds like you need to call Epson. Let's get you into tech support and into that queue so that they can follow up. That does not sound like a normal situation to me. Um, and Frank has asked about a garment creator question. Um, Frank, I'm going to ask you to go to our uh, web page that has the webinars and the previously recorded webinars. So go to equipmentzone.com. Um, we actually answered that question in that webinar about how to multiple images in the shirt view. And if you don't find it there, I'm happy to have one of our support team follow up with you. So that's a really good question. Um, I'm not dodging it. I just think that these guys are probably not gonna be the, the three that would answer that question. Um, let's go back to one of our previously designed cues that we've talked about because we get questions all the time. And one of the things that comes up frequently is um, why do you have to leave some DTG printers running for 24 hours? People come up to us at the booth and they call you guys and they're on our web chat all the time. Um, how do we best answer that question? Uh, I can jump in on that. The, there, there's two, two situations. One is they're using that, that printer is using a print head that was not, that didn't start life as a DTG print head. It started life as a paper printer, uh, taken out usually out of an Epson, uh, desktop printer where you print out, you know, your resume, print out a, a boarding pass, and they've taken that print head and they've used it on a, in a printer that, uh, and they've introduced an ink system that wasn't meant to go through that print head. So you have to run them 24 hours a day. So it'll spit, spit, spit ink uh, around the clock into your waste tank to keep that print head open. The other scenario is, uh, is a situation where the white is printing and right behind it's another print head with, with color. Well, that white has to dry so quickly that um, there's, there's issues with clogging because the, the ink will also dry quickly in the print head. So in, in that scenario, you'll see, uh, like at a trade show, uh, that printer would have a, a humidifier sitting underneath it to help keep that print head open. So two, th two situations. Uh, either a print head that wasn't meant to, to be, go in that printer or a print head that, uh, that's printing ink that has to dry so fast that uh, you might run into clogging issues. And, and by the way, th those printers that, that have uh, Epson print heads in them, so somebody might say, well, hey, it's just like the Epson printer. It's got the same print head. It doesn't. The Epson printer print head is made for water-based textile inks. These other print heads are not made for that ink system. So the adhesives inside of that print head are, are basically uh, dissolving every time you print a shirt with one of those converted over paper printers. So that's, that's why they have to run all the time. That's why they say print a shirt every single day be, because they've got to keep that ink moving or it'll clog. So fact or fiction, do we have, do we have to leave the F2100 running 24 hours a day? No, you do not. So that would be a fiction. We do not. Fiction. Okay. Yes. Matt, is there anything you want to add to this idea of printers continually running and why they have to run for 24 hours a day? Well, Terry was 100% correct in his answer. You know, most of the time it is printers that are hacked printers. 
and they do have to keep the print head what they call wet capping because if they did not wet cap the print head, it would completely dry out. You know, it would completely dry out, it would clog the, the nozzles and you could end up with having a, a dead uh, print head. And it's because the ink was not made for that print head. You know, the beauty of buying a machine from a company such as Epson is we're the manufacturer of the print head. We're the manufacturer of the ink. So it's a match set. So you know that you're going to get a uh, really good longevity out of that print head when you use the, the matched ink set with it. Excellent. Excellent answer, gentlemen. Okay, um, let's move on to one of our other preset questions. The question I have for the three of you is, why do I have to pre-treat shirts at all? Why do we even have to pre-treat a shirt? I'll, I'll well, jump on that. Jeff. Since everybody else had just answered. <laughs> so um, when you're printing with white ink, if you don't pre-treat um, with not just white ink, but even with the CMYK, that ink is soaking into the shirt. Cotton acts like a sponge and it's going to soak it up. It's a water-based ink. What the pre-treat does is it allows that ink to sit on top of the cotton. Now, if you're pr printing on a black shirt, you're, you have for a dark colored shirt, have to put down a white underbase and that white would just blend right in with the fabric so that pre-treat allows it to sit on top and, and as soon as the white ink touches the pre-treated shirt a chemical reaction begins and it starts to cure immediately so that when the CMYK goes back and is printed right over the top of it that ink will sit on top of the white instead of blending into it or soaking into the shirt and then you'll get the perfect print. You know for all the screen printers out there uh, this is just like if I'm printing a, a navy sweatshirt. I'm going to print white ink. I'm going to put it under my flash unit for about 15 seconds to gel that ink. That's going to give me a good base to print on. Then, then I'm going to pr pr print color on top. Same effect. The only difference is when that white ink touches the pre-treat, it's, it's, it's gelling, it's curing from the bottom up as, as opposed to the top down like you do in screen printing. But it, it's a, the exact same principle. Excellent answers. A follow-up question to our previous segment. Do I have to keep the F2000 running continuously? No, you do not. Rick Davis has asked. And the answer from not. Matt Rome is no, you do not. Okay. We, so, we uh, in, in our showroom uh, here in Phoenix, and it's the same in the showroom in New Jersey, at the end of the day, we go around and turn all the printers off. And, and if it's Labor Day weekend, uh, we turn it off on Friday afternoon. We come back on Tuesday morning, turn it back on and start printing shirts again. And, and, and let me add something. And, and hopefully uh, Harry's not listening. <laughs> he, he is. <laughs> yes. Well, over Christmas, we all have home offices too. And there are five people that work out of, out of the, the Phoenix Tempe, Arizona office, but uh, we all, all have home offices. So over Christmas, nobody went in the office for three weeks and that printer sat there turned off and came back in and we had a we had a demo coming in turned it on did a uh, nozzle check uh did a did a head cleaning and started printing shirts again so you know <laughs> Gary says what <laughs> three weeks <laughs> I, I would like to just add we did that by design so we could tell this story harry this was exactly <laughs> exactly uh, jeff really really wanted to go in and i said no jeff we <laughs> have to do this test i don't care if it's christmas i'm going in so uh, the, the follow-up uh, that I'd like to follow up with that is that we have never replaced that printhead. We have uh, recently, just after three years, replaced the capping station, which will prolong the printhead life, but we've never had to replace that printhead. And, and that printer, by the way, is one of the original uh, F2100s, the first six that, that, that came into the country. It doesn't even say F2100 on the front. It's a prototype. And, and uh, never, well, very minimal maintenance been, has been done to it. Excellent questions and great answers, guys. So two came in that are both related. They have to do with polyester shirts. So I'm gonna combine the question from Heber Carillo and Kevin Elvin. Kevin says, there's a new pre-treatment, new pre-treat solution out for synthetic shirts. It appears to be very expensive. How is the experience going with that pre-treatment 
and is it as close to vibrant as it would be on cotton? Terry, I know we get this question a lot about, yeah. can I print a polyester shirt? What are the steps to pre-treat it? And will the vibrancy and longevity still be there? Well, um, let, me, let me start by saying, the, any DDG printer, the ideal scenario is 100% cotton. And, and you're gonna get your absolute brightest image. Can you print polyester? You can. Um, the new pre-treats that are out there, we thought the results were not tremendous. And uh, so we still use Epson dark pre-treat to do polyester. You have to experiment and try some different polyester shirts. But what we do is we pre-treat, uh, dry it with a heat press, pre-treat it a second time, dry it with a heat press. Then we print it like a normal shirt, uh, lay down the white underbase, uh, do the CMYK on top. But here's, here's the rub with polyester and, and every decorator knows this. Uh, when you dye cotton, the dye goes inside the cotton and it stays there. When you dye polyester, the dye sits on top of, of the threads and under heat, it releases. It's called dye migration. So that beautiful red Under Armour shirt that you paid 80 bucks for and you printed a white image on it, once you heat set it, all of a sudden that white image is pink. Well, that's, that's dye migration and it happens to screen printers, happens to everybody. But that, that means you have to cure at a lower temperature. So we cure at 275 degrees for 45 seconds, but that's not enough to cure the ink on the shirt. We do it a second time, 275, 45 seconds, not enough to cure the shirt. We do it a third time, 275, 45 seconds. Then we can get an acceptable print and get good washability. But, you know, is it, is it worth your time and effort to do that? You, here's my advice. There's no decoration method that fits every scenario. There's no machine that does everything. Use this printer for what it does best rather than trying to make it do something else. So, you know, cotton, high cotton blends uh, are, are, are the answer. There, there are better ways to decorate polyester than- Those are, those are words wear. of wisdom from a screen printing, apparel decorating veteran uh, who has veteran, more, than, more, than, <laughs> more than 35 years in the industry. You know, I think it's an interesting point to bring up, guys, is that um, this is a technology that's existed 16 years and with white ink, 14 years, as, Correct. as, as Terry so often reminds us. Um, and in his world, I mean, that's like, you know, probably feels like a few months, right, Terry? It's just- <laughs> No, I will fiction. say- That's fiction. I will fiction. say that's fiction. fiction. Matt Rome can fill us in on when the first fiction. DTG printer okay. really came about. I, I, I set that up, set up so well. <laughs> Matt, what do you mean, Matt? What's, what's, the, what's the fact <laughs> there? Set us straight. Well, hybrid DTG printing was invented in the early 90s, 92. Really? Are you sure about that? How do but you know? the single platen DTG printer was invented in the mid nineties and actually it was patented in 1996. Okay. It was, and I bet if I asked you the number, you would know that patent number. Uh, probably not, but oh. <laughs> you can Google it though. It's easy to Google. I'm teasing. Why do you know why I'm teasing you? I so know why. Finish the story. I'm sorry. I interrupted no. you. Yeah, I want you to finish the story. Tell oh, us, how do you know that? Because I am the inventor of direct-to-garment printing. And there you can you go. Google that, and you will see that is true. Because you know, everything on the internet is true, right? Well, I was just <laughs> going to say, according to Terry, not everything on the internet is true. Just found out. That is a, that is a fact. So, uh, yeah, it's but the technology is still new. We would still all agree to that, correct? Yeah, really... It took off in 2005 is when the industry really took off though. It took a while to get there. Right. Excellent. Okay, um, let's go back to our list here. I've got yeah, a question. Quick. Yeah, go ahead. You hear me? Yeah, yep. so just a real quick follow up on, on what you were talking about um, printing uh, on polyester. You know, Epson has a great solution. They're not, I don't know how many people know this, but Epson makes dye sublimation printers. And, and that is a great way, the perfect way to decorate polyester shirts. Yeah. And the prints are amazing. And the printers that Epson makes for that are workhorses. And if you did any comparison, you'd find out that Epson's the best. When yeah, and I'm so glad you brought that up because Amy and I, and give credit to Amy, did a fantastic job of reviewing each of those printers. We have, a, we have an Epson printer specifically for dye sublimation. 
uh, for every budget. So there's an entry level, there's a production level, and then there's these two huge, amazing printers. Um, so please watch one of our previously recorded webinars specifically about the review of all five of those printers. And I think you'll be impressed with, uh, with what you said, Jeff. You're 100%, 100% correct. That is a fact, Jeff Bordenthaler. Bring in the facts. Uh, okay, so how do I get rid, fact or fiction, first of all, and then tell us the answer. So fact or fiction, is there sometimes a pre-treat box on my shirts? I'll jump on that. Uh, and then how do I get rid of it? Okay. Well, there's a couple of things. One is you might possibly be just seeing the outline, the, the, the edge of your heat press on the shirt. And, and if that bothers you, you can take a steamer and just go right around that edge and it'll take it right out. The, but more commonly, that box has nothing to do with the heat press. It is applying too much pretreat to the shirt. So it, it, once you take that shirt off your, uh, off your heat press, if it feels stiff, that's too much pretreat, and and most people use far too much pretreat. We we uh, did an open house at the office in New Jersey some time ago, and and um, we were actually demonstrating using the Wagner handheld paint sprayer. And every time we did that demonstration, anybody in the room who used that sprayer would say, "Oh, I use way too much." Every single time, oh, I use way too much. And it's so easy with a hand sprayer to, because if this is good, this has got to be better, right? <laughs> no, if it, if it feels stiff, you should not, or you, you've used way too much pre-treat, so. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. Uh, we just did an extensive webinar on this. You've already mentioned it on um, pre-treating. And Roy brought up the fact that uh, the Epson pre-treat leaves less of a box that you will notice than other pre-treats when properly mixed. So I would encourage people to go back and watch that and, and get real real fine details on pre-treating. Excellent, thank you, Jeff. Hey, Jay, then, you yes. know, here's the other thing too. Epson doesn't make a pre-treat machine, okay? So I'm totally unbiased, but the number one tech support question we get is on pre-treating. And the sad fact is a lot of people will get into this business and they will try to make do with, like Terry said, using a hand sprayer or using a roller or buying some cheap pre-treat machine off eBay. You know, you cannot do that. If you're gonna be in a professional business and want consistent results, you have to purchase a professional pre-treat machine. Well, Jeff, do you, thank you, Matt. I 100% agree with you. Clearly we're biased and, and uh, Jeff, thank you for bringing up the fact that we had that pre-treatment um, webinar. There were a lot of great facts there. And one thing I wanted to add and remind people is that pre-treatment box that you see there is not permanent. It, it's going to wash out at the first washing. Now, is that a fact or is that a fiction? That's a fact. That's a fact. Okay. So, a lot, of, a lot of that is expectation. A lot of that has to do with the delivery of the shirt after it's been printed and it has not yet been laundered. So let's remind ourselves that it's not a crisis. Um, it, it, it needs to be explained. People sometimes do freak out a little bit about it, but the answer is it disappears once you've washed your shirt. Um, okay, a couple of things on that. We seem to be hitting a few pre-treatment questions here. Back to Terry, since you brought up sweatshirts, do you feel, this is from Frank, Frank Zeckman, do you feel printing on dark sweatshirts with white ink would require or be a better situation if you double pre-treat? I would say uh, I, if it's a blended sweatshirt, and especially if you go down to like a 50-50, because when somebody calls in and says, hey, my, my, uh, my red sweatshirt doesn't look, uh, the image isn't very bright, uh, I always say, well, what, what's, what kind of fabric is it? Well, Sandmar was having a sale. Well, that translates to it's a 50-50, right? And you don't want to tell me. <laughs> um, so, so yes, double pre-treating a, a garment like that, uh, pre-treat it, dry it, pre-treat it again and dry it. It will give you a better base to print on. And that's the same with, uh, you know, maybe somebody loves uh, Gildan ultra cotton shirts. Well, those are great for screen printing, but the, the shirt fabric dictates what kind of finished graphic you're going to get on your shirt. So if, if, if you've just got to print that shirt, it's the same deal. You pre-treat it, you dry it, you pre-treat it, you dry it again. And then 
you're going to get uh, more than an acceptable finished product. Excellent. Anybody else want to add? Well, there's a, I, I, there are sweatshirts out there that have the blend with the outer outside 100% cotton or less of a blend. We sell a great uh, line of sweatshirts on our website, right. equipmentzone.com. But, um, you know, there are a lot of factors that go into how your prints turn out, whether it's a sweatshirt, a t-shirt, a golf towel, a tote bag, whatever you're printing on. We, we, we can't say it enough the the formula is what matters. So it starts with your graphic, what kind of quality graphic you have. It starts with your substrate. What is that blend? How are you pre-treating it? And what settings you're using on your printer and how you cure it. So those are the five key elements of the formula. And it could be the sweatshirt. It could be the pre-treat. So you just need to diagnose that. And, and we help with that. Great, thank you guys. Uh, another question on our set. Uh, some resellers really push third-party RIP software. What's the benefit to buying that? Well, I'll, uh, I'll answer that. Uh, you know, in the past, we, we promoted third-party RIP software because it, it would allow, and, and mostly graphic designers like it because they really like to get in there and tinker with the settings. And, and uh, it would allow you to do things like archive your images or go in and say, well, I wonder what it's going to look like with 87% pre-treat or 87% white as opposed to 90% white or whatever. But um, today, uh, virtually all of our customers just use Garment Creator because every new version of Garment Creator, and by the way, when a new version comes out, it's, it's a free download. You never have to pay for Garment Creator or for upgrades to it. But, but every new version... It, it encompasses all those great things that third-party RIP software used to offer. And, and you know, when you go on to, let's say, t-shirt forums, and you see somebody showing a, an image on this shirt, and it's all, it's kind of dull and washed out looking, and, and an image on this shirt, and it's really bright and crisp, uh, nobody's RIP software increases the resolution. So you're being misled there. And to the point where one of our techs went and found that exact same image, uh, that they were showing to 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 kind of uh, promote their RIP software, found that exact same image on the internet, printed it on the F2100 just using the standard settings, no tweaking, nothing, just selecting a print mode, and it um, it looked fabulous. So, you know, these side by side comparisons, if it if it sounds too good to be true, probably is. And and those RIP software is a thousand twelve hundred dollars. So. Um, I, I always recommend to people, if you think you need a, a, a RIP software, a third-party RIP software, start with Garment Creator. And then if you really feel it, uh, a lot of times they'll have a free download for you to try. But uh, I, Jeff, you'd probably agree. I'd say 99% of our customers today use Garment Creator and no other RIP. And maybe Jeff, before you answer that, you could you could kind of set the, set the stage for folks that might be newer don't even understand what is a rip software so a rip software is it's it's processing your graphic for for printing and basically you're using that instead of garment creator and the the big hype around it is that these rip softwares um, promote that your prints will cost less uh, if you use their software and it's been my experience that the you still have to use the same amount of ink to to make that print look good. So they can program those, those, that software to say whatever they want. Um, and, and frankly, I just don't believe it. I mean, if it's in their best interest and that's what they're using to help sell their software, they can make it say whatever they want. So with um, my experience to answer uh, what Terry said, yeah, um, over three years I've been working for Equipment Zone now, I've had one client purchase RIP software from me. And that was just because that client has always used RIP software and wanted to continue with it and just believed in it. But nobody else, I've never sold somebody an Epson Director garment printer that came back and told me, no, nope, this garment creator just doesn't work. I really need an, an expensive RIP software to make it work. Everybody I've, I've dealt with seems to be very, very happy with garment creator. Well said, well said. It makes sense to me that you might look at it as let's master the basics and, and, and 
work with what's given and make sure that if garment creator is addressing 95% of your needs, that then you would say, this is the right tool for this job. And, and I like to, to what you said earlier, Jeff, about a formula. It's part of the formula. So if garment creator is free and it's the tool that Epson is, is using and has given me, let me master that first. And then if I have that top 5% where I really need to fine tune, tinker, or I really want to go in and create my own channels or you know, whatever I'm trying to accomplish, maybe then you would be you know, a, a candidate for, for a third party RIP software. Yeah, and, um, and, and be sure to, uh, to talk to tech support, our tech support or Epson's tech support, before you put a Band-Aid on that print and the Band-Aid being, well, to get a better print because I'm not getting a great print, I need to invest another thousand dollars. Chances are you're doing something else incorrectly in the process that, that we can resolve for you. And, and I wanna make sure that people know, Terry, I'm not an expert, but just as common sense would, would lay this out for me, it seems from what I've read online that everybody that's promoting that RIP software is, is telling the audience that they've dramatically decreased the amount of white ink and therefore the savings is gonna go down or the expense is gonna go down, they're gonna save and somehow the prints are gonna be dramatically better. So I don't know if that's true or not true, but let's just say that they save a few cents of white ink. Let's say it's 20 cents of white ink. So if I have to spend 1200 to $1,500 to save 20 cents of ink, it's gonna be a long haul before that thing's paid for itself. And I guarantee you in a real production world, Every print is different. Right. Exactly so right. I don't, I just, I, I, I'm not even saying don't get the RIP software. I'm just saying look at it through a little bit more of common sense before you go invest that kind of cash. There might be something else that you need to, to accomplish and be successful. You know, let's, let's also think about the buyer. Is the buyer going to seriously know the difference? Exactly. I don't know. They're not. I, I, would, I would tell you that they probably would not. There might be some buyers that are very particular at the high end. They're artists. Um, you know, they come from the sign world where they're, you know, all dialed in on DPI and, you know, they're just, that's their, that's their thing. You know, they're, they got the jeweler's loop out and they're looking at these graphics. <laughs> well, if that's your client base, I hope you're charging them a lot of money. <laughs> exactly. Well, here's what I always say in my classes. It's just a t-shirt. Nobody dies. So everybody is. relax. It is. <laughs> Um, so quick question before I ask one more off our list, somebody asked earlier about what, what is our opinion on using pre pre-treated shirts like RTP? Uh, pre-treated shirts here. Here's the thing you should know about pre-treated shirts. Number one, there's no pre-treated shirt right now that I know of on the market that is using Epson genuine pre-treat. So when you're buying a pre-treated shirt, they're using some other pre-treat that may not be optimized for the Epson ink set. It could be optimized for some other ink set or it's just generic across the board. So our ink sets match with our pre-treat, okay? So that when you utilize that, you get a very good wash result also, you know that it's safe. Uh, when you're getting a pre-treated shirt, unless you're doing like extra large black all the time, you're probably gonna need to learn to pre-treat anyway, because I doubt that there's anybody selling a ladies V-neck in seafoam green 2XL out there that's pre-treated, right? Yeah, so you're going to need to learn how to pre-treat anyway. So you're, you're cutting yourself short if you do not learn the pre-treat process and, and you know, pre-treat all your shirts yourself. Matt, it sounds like you're saying it's possible, but beware and know what you're getting into. And you're probably going to be a great candidate for pre-treating anyway. Anyway. Yes. So, okay. So we're not saying, no. we're not saying no. And we've tested no. and they've printed. Okay. They do work. Uh, that's the thing. They do work, but you need to know everything that's involved. Right. Well, and, and also to Matt's point, the, uh, you know, when you decide all I'm going to do or, or print on RTP or, or already pre-treated shirts, your very next customer is going to say, I need Tennessee orange. Well, you know what? Regular orange isn't going to cut it. Tennessee orange is a very unique color. And 
you're never going to get that as a pre-treated chair. You, so you're still going to have to pre-treat. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Our panelists are just on fire today. <laughs> just laying down the facts. I laying love down it. Facts. <laughs> Woo! Factor Fiction Episode Three. This might be our best attended and our most popular. And I don't know awesome. if that's. I don't know if it's because you guys are both wearing matching shirts or just Matt Rome is in the house. So either way, I'm thrilled. I think it's because Matt Rome's in the house, if, okay. if you ask me. Well, it, I think I, so, too. I, I, nobody asked you, Matt. Okay. Oh, um, okay. Thanks, Terry. Go, <laughs> that's even funnier because he thought it was you, Terry. Why, why? Here's one. Here's one. We get this all no, the time. No, Terry said it was because I'm here. That's I know. Why I, I did say that. that. He did. He did. And he was serious, too. Why don't my shirts look like the shirts you guys print at the trade show? Terry well, Combs? I, I think Jeff already, <laughs> I think Jeff really answered this. You got to have the right shirt. You know, if you walk around, you, you'll see that every, every uh, DTG company, whether it's Epson or some other brand, almost everybody's using the same shirts. And why is that? Because some shirts print better than others. And, and so in our booth, you're gonna get a cotton heritage shirt because nothing prints better than the cotton heritage. You know, uh, Sanmar has a, has a great shirt as well. Uh, the district and the numbers escaping me. Uh, but uh, so we use the right shirt. We know how to pre-treat properly. And, and most people don't. It, if you walk by a booth and they're using a paint roller to pre-treat shirts, keep moving because that is not the way you pre-treat a shirt. And third, good quality artwork. You know, we're, we're not gonna be printing 72 DPI files that are an inch by an inch. We're gonna print 300 DPI files that are saved at full size. And, and, and that's the key, you know, that, and, and of course, uh, also understanding how to properly cure the shirt when you're done. But that, that's why our shirt look, looks so good because we, we, hit, we hit all the, uh, all the points in the process and make sure they're all correct. Yeah, we didn't skip any of the parts or the instructions of the formula. Well, like here's, here's the other thing too, Jay. I get this question a lot. People will call me up and they'll say, I just bought a printer from whoever and how come my prints don't look like the shirts you're printing at the trade show? Number one answer is they weren't trained properly on how to utilize the equipment. Like Terry said, there's a lot of points to hit. Number two is they're not pre-treating properly. They're trying to pre-treat by hand or they bought a cheap low-end pre-treater that doesn't pre-treat correctly. Excellent answer. Obviously we loved that answer, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's true, it, that's, been our, that's been our experience. And we, we've seen, um, I don't want to go into the deep end of the pool where I'm not supposed to, but we've even compared the same print from the dealers and we've seen sometimes our prints look better. And the only variable that's been different has been the pretreatment process. So we've come to that conclusion as well. Yeah. You know, Jay, even, even if they are pretreating properly, you go back to the five key elements of the formula. It starts with number one, with the graphic. If, a client gave you a graphic that they got off the internet and it's 72 DPI and it's a one inch by one inch graphic and they just copied it, you know, they just right click, save file as, and it, you know, it's a tiny little thing that's going to affect how that looks. That's not going to print well. Absolutely. So having quality graphics, which is another webinar that we should do. Jeff, that is a fact. That is a fact, but the pre-treating, the shirt, <laughs> the printing and the, the heat pressing, all of it matters. We're starting to sound like a broken record, but the, the facts are the facts. Um, we got a great compliment that you guys are spraying out the good advice like a, like a machine gun. So, and, and this per person particularly and specifically says, I love it when you have Matt Rome on. So, wow, Matt, there you go. Is his wife on here too? <laughs> it was not, I checked, I checked, it was okay. not. It was my mother. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Brady says not him <laughs> yeah exactly let's let's wrap this up let's wrap this up we're at, we're at 55 after the hour you guys have done an awesome job at establishing fact and fiction you've shared tremendous wisdom great insights i want to wrap this up because i've also had this question um, i know jeff and terry have been out there in the front lines are getting these questions and luckily we have matt so matt can set the record straight 
first question, last question. Um, and before I ask this question, remember, if you, if you typed in on the Q&A, those get recorded. And if we didn't address your question specifically, either Terry or Jeff will follow up with an email. They'd be happy to talk to you. I'll, I'll flash up um, a contact um, sheet here in just a minute before we end. Um, but th so, so this is our last question. We heard that there's a new printer coming out to replace the F2100. Why don't that's, I go to that first? That's false. 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 Totally that is false. fiction. Yes. Here's the thing. That. We do have a new printer that will be out this summer. It is called the Epson SureColor F3070. Now, this is not a replacement for the 2100. This is yet a new printer. If you look at Epson, we make almost our full line of, of textile and other printing equipment. We have a small, medium, and a large. Well, we're coming out with a large machine, which is the 3070. The big difference is the 3070 is considerably more, at least more than three times what the 2100 is in cost. Also, it prints around a shirt a minute, so it's very high speed. And it's not the, you know, we realize different people have different needs, so that's why we've created a larger printer. But it is not a replacement for the 2100. It is just another DTG printer offering from Epson. That's excellent, I'm happy to hear that. And can you give us a range? I probably know, I already know you can't give us a date. Can you give us a range of when this new printer would be available? Summer. Summer. Well, yes. summer, summer in Arizona started yesterday. So. Okay. <laughs> summer it's 102 on the today, so yeah. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> so so let's, let's say toward the end of summer, just to be Yeah, sure. probably towards the end of summer. Okay, okay. So we don't want to hold you to in a date and anything like no. that. We know not to. Um, thank you, Matt. Thank you for explaining you. that and being involved and, and answering today. Appreciate that Terry was able to make some time today and, and wake up on time. Thank you, Jeff, for joining us. We're glad that you are here. Um, and as most of you know, we are recording this session. So we will add this to our previously recorded webinars, which you can find at equipmentzone.com. Um, if there's, unless there's anything else that you, all three of you want to add or say before we go, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Jay. I appreciate you setting all this up and, and being the host. Uh, I get a lot of great feedback from my clients that have purchased and they absolutely love this. So thank you, Jay. You are hundred percent welcome. My pleasure. Um, anything else from Mr. Combs or Mr. I, Rome? I just wanted to say that uh, equipment zone is open. Have, we have plenty of ink. We're shipping uh, printhead cleaning kits, things like that. It's all shipping out. If you order by three o'clock, we're still trying to get them out the door the same day and uh, a little bit of a skeleton crew over there, but uh, but getting product out the door and our tech support is still uh, going strong. So, you know, we're, we're pretty much uh, the same as, as before this happened. So you can reach out to us and, and we're happy to, to assist you. Excellent. So I also want to then say, I'll close with uh, stay tuned for future webinars. We will have, it seems to be our, we're, we're trying to accomplish two every week. We have new topics. Uh, tune in for Thursday. Thursdays is going to be about dye sublimation. Uh, it's a top 10 frequently asked questions for dye sub. So I had a lot of folks that asked questions about dye sublimation or polyester. So tune into that one on Thursday. We will have future webinars down the road. So stay, stay plugged in. Uh, check the equipmentzone.com website frequently. Open up your emails that we send you so that you'll you'll know dates and times and otherwise guys thank you very much i'm going to stop recording so let's all wave goodbye thank you jay bye thanks guys thank you matt